You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. So we talked about coaches yesterday. Guess what we're talking about today? We're talking about head coaches once again. I actually was hoping to kind of hone in a little bit. Uh, I wanted to talk about Fitzgerald and McDaniels a little more in depth because those two kind of rose to the top. However, uh, Fitzgerald has recently come out and said pretty strongly, ain't going to happen. In fact, he said he's not going anywhere. He's staying at Northwestern forever. Um, usually I think you can kind of take those things with a grain of salt, but I mean, he, he didn't have to come out and say it as definitively as he did. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and take him right off the table. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, which I guess is a little bit unfortunate, but it's, it's whatever, you know, I, 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 I still don't even have anyone that I really like. Um, you know, I mentioned David Shaw. I like his personality. But if you watch Stanford like I did this morning, it's like, man, I'm just I'm watching the Packers offense. I mean, it's just a, a very straightforward, you know, two wide receivers line up to one side, one wide receiver lines up to the other side. They run relatively straight lines. At some point, the line bends, you know, it's just it's boring. And it's um, and, you know, listen, I. I. I hmm. <laughs> The Packers have made that work in the past, and um, I'm not saying that that's an impossible thing. Obviously, if it was just a foregone conclusion that that system is inefficient and ineffective in 20... Oh, by the way, Happy New Year in 2019, um, then everybody would just stop doing it. But I'm, I'm going to stick with my thoughts on this because I don't think the Packers have what it takes to run that system anymore. They've got to get more modern, um, and, and 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 part of the adaptation process and the morphing of these offenses is, again, we're kind of, it's action and reaction, and everything's just reacting to everything else. And the new modern offenses aren't, I wouldn't even say elite or better than everything else. It's just sort of the newest way to manipulate modern defenses, and it works because it's just kind of the new thing. Eventually, defenses will adapt and find ways to take advantage of or manipulate the current offenses, and then offenses need to adapt again, which will then in turn cause defenses to need to adapt. So again, this is—I I don't want to just, you know, act as though, you know, like it, an appeal to novelty or anything. Like because it's new, it's better, or we just need to be new for the sake of being new. I just really think that that's what's going to work, especially for the Packers now, because I do think with Ted Thompson kind of having several misses in the last few years, not having a lot of talent on this team, as well as everybody leaving, I think we do have to kind of lean on creativity a little more. You know, you look at teams like the Bears. The Bears' offensive production has been really good this year. The Bears' talent on offense is not that good. Trubisky is not even in the top 32. I don't know if you knew this. There's only 32 teams in the NFL. He's he's really, really bad. Their running backs really aren't anything special. Their wide receivers aren't anything special. Their tight end is decent. The offensive line is pretty good. But, I mean, there's just there's nothing really there. But the scheme, the scheme is what works. And, again, if the Packers can kind of lean on that a little more as opposed to saying, listen, Rodgers, I just need you to make magic happen, and saying that to the wide receivers as well, listen, guys, I need you guys to just step up and win but instead manipulate because you put defenses in positions where it's like you have to make decisions and no matter what decision you make, you're wrong. That's how the Patriots win. You're doing everything right, but you're still not accounting for this guy. So I'm going to throw it to him. And it's going to be three yards down you know, down the field, and he's going to run for another three. We're going to get five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten yards on this little dump-off play. And then we're just going to run up to the line of scrimmage and do it again and again and again and again and again. And you're going to be tired by halftime. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to be demoralized. And it wasn't even because of elite players. Patriots, same thing. They don't have elite wide receivers. Gronk isn't even elite anymore. He's he's having a real down year, and he's always hurt. 
Brady's a very accurate passer and is very intelligent, which is why he can make this system work, because he kind of understands, based on the alignment, who should be open. He also seems to understand opposite Rodgers that it almost looks like he's looking for the check down, primarily. But the point is, it's, you know, it's not elite players, it's a scheme that works. And you don't want to get too scheme dependent, but I think you just got to kind of understand who you are and what you are, and the Packers aren't in... This isn't 2011 or 12 or 13 or, or 10 or whatever. It's not those Packers anymore. So anyways, all that to say, when I watch the Stanford offense, it's like, you know, maybe insofar as, you know, discipline, um, you know, coaching and motivation and those kinds of things, he could be a great person to have in Green Bay. But I don't know that it's going to look very different than a Mike McCarthy offense. Beyond that, they're, if I'm not mistaken, they're... Um, a run-heavy team as well. That is to say, they like big, strong, road-grading offensive linemen and running backs that can just absolutely dominate behind them. Similar to similar to what Madison has, I guess. So, anyways, that you know, again, I'm I'm just telling you why I'm having troubles. And um, so, I, I do want to go a little bit in depth, but I also just want to look at. There's a huge pile now of new names. Some people that have come in, some people that have gone out. So. Um, talk about those guys, give a little bit of insights into those guys, and then if there's time, kind of give my own personal opinions. I looked a lot into Josh McDaniels today. I, I, it's just so hard, man. It's so hard to come to a definitive decision because you can look at it and say you have to give him credit for the Patriots, and then you look at it and go, well, maybe I don't have to. You look at this, the failures not only in Denver but in St. Louis, and you say, yeah, but you look at Denver and they lost their quarterback and he still got their record about the same until they fell off the next year. And then St. Louis, they really fell off. Like, they were a bad team. He got there. They were just a complete trash team. He left and they got better. You look at the Patriots and it's like, well, look at all the success they've had. Yeah, but when he left, Bill Belichick took over. They were fine. Um you know, Bill O'Brien, I believe, got uh, promoted. They went even further, you know, 13 wins. And then uh, he gets a head coaching job. They have a vacancy. Uh, McDaniels is floating around because nobody wants to touch him because he's just been, you know, damaged goods. And they're like, yeah, sure, come on back. We can make it work with you. You understand our system. Which, by the way, the Patriots have a very different system that I had not even heard of until today. This is a system that he tried to employ everywhere he went, and it just wasn't working, which makes me a little bit nervous as well. Might as well talk about him now since I'm talking about him, and it's fresh in my mind. But I really think, at least as far as St. Louis goes, that was maybe the biggest problem because he implemented a a brand spanking new system, and they went from an 8-win team to a 2-win team. And it just, for whatever reason, maybe it's just the the particular... um, the quarterback the wide receivers the players it just wasn't a good fit for them I'm not really sure what happened but it did not work at all but the the system is called Earhart Perkins it actually I believe originated in New England Um, according to the Wikipedia's it was installed by Charlie Weiss under Bill Belichick well Charlie Weiss which is kind of incredible was only the offensive coordinator and I'm assuming this is when he would have done it is when he was an offensive coordinator because that's when you would have that much power and still be under somebody but that was from 2000 to 2004 so it would have been right in that time which by the way is right when the Patriots started becoming awesome but uh, he implemented that system it's kind of uh, expanded I think as of right now the Houston Texans and the New York Jets run a similar system it's kind of hard to discuss it because you talk about these systems in broad terms and obviously there's adaptations throughout and the Patriots at this point in time look a lot more probably like the Bears than they did in 2000 because they've added sort of the wrinkles and the motion and all this other stuff but ultimately it's it's a little it's a little less high flying Um, you, you can definitely see it with the Patriots because it's a system that wants to control the ball they want uh, time of possession in their favor uh, they're going to run the ball you know the the the, the quicker shorter passes um, uh, you know and I think one of the other benefits of it and I've talked about this before <clears throat> with Tom Brady even though I didn't understand the system and I still don't but the one thing that I was saying is you know they do a lot of this dink and dunk stuff and they also run the ball relatively effectively but um, they they set up play action really well 
because you play close to the line of scrimmage throughout the entire game. You run the ball, whether it's really effectively or not, but consistently enough that people are going to expect the run. And that's when you come out with play action and you just destroy somebody deep. And, and you know, you can look at it and say that this is a system that can run well with Aaron Rodgers and, and actually the Packers in general. And I'm not saying I want this because, again, every time uh, he McDaniels leaves and tries to institute this somewhere else, it doesn't really work. But if you just think about the general principles that I've said, if we can get Aaron Rodgers to buy into, let's play it close to the line of scrimmage, we'll run kind of the, a lot of wide receiver screens, you know, whatever. And then we'll also run the ball in a sort of, sort of smash mouth kind of fashion. In other words, we're just going to get an offensive line that gets a lot of push. We're going to get a guy like Jamal Williams or Aaron Jones to, to just really hit the hole get us this three, four, five yard. And then of course we're throwing for four or five yards. So, I mean, it's like my dad explained to me when I was very little, not really understanding football yet, four yards every play is going to get you a first down. So it's just an easy way to, to it, it legitimately, obviously you, you want to play the odds a little bit because if you're doing that, eventually you're going to get an incompletion at some point, but three, four yards is not the worst thing. You, you don't have to be upset about that. Take the yards. I actually think he told me three, but that would require you to go for it on fourth, and I don't think anyone's going to do that, but we'll call it four. Another thing that changes is the terminology changes. So, you know, what Aaron Rodgers has understood for a very long time, he's going to have to scrap it and start from scratch. You know, things are going to become numbers and words, and, you know, everything just changes. Now, it's supposed to be kind of simplified, which is nice, and again, makes sense for this kind of a system because it is a hurry up, but it's also just, it's quick. It's quick, but it's not super flashy. It's kind of the opposite of what the Packers are, or at least what they try to be. But again, I'm I'm, I'm less, I don't know. I guess that would be a big thing for me if, if I'm interviewing Josh McDaniels. I want to know how close to your heart is this Earhart Perkins system. If you want to come in with that terminology, I guess that's fine. But are you stuck in this, or are you willing to adapt? And I think it's pretty clear the Patriots have been adapting, but I, I you know, I need to know definitively, like if, if you come in here, are you going to be able to look at our team and try to design an offense around our team, or are you just going to come in here with what you know, slap a book down, say, here, learn this, and I'm going to go run out and try to run the Patriots offense because that's all I know how to do, and it just happens to work over there. Bill taught me a system called Earhart Perkins, and I call the plays according to the system, and it works because... It's already been instituted, and again, we we talk about Brady being a system quarterback. I don't think that's necessarily true, but there is definitely a system that works in New England, but that doesn't mean that system is going to work everywhere and with everyone. So are you going to be able to say, listen, this isn't working, this is why it's not working, and this is how we're going to fix it. We're going to do a little more of this. We're going to do a little less of this, because we have a different offensive line. We have different running backs. We've we've built a, a team around being West Coast, right? We, we've got the big wide receivers on the outside, you know, all, all, all that stuff that comes with it. Emphasis on receiving backs and whatnot. Can you come in here and adapt your Earhart Perkins system, your, your 2018 Earhart Perkins system into a 2019 Green Bay Packers system? Whatever that might be, call it whatever you want to call it. That's, again, this is another reason why it's so hard to say whether I like or dislike somebody. I have no idea if he can do that. Or is willing to do that? How how much is he willing to stray from his comfort zone? And do I even want him to stray? Is he creative enough to be able to stray and make it work? Or is he going to try to stray and just fall apart? Because he's not a kind of guy that's going to implement or build a system. He can run a system, but he can't build a system. It's another pretty big question mark. There is a very big difference between those things. You know, the, the Charlie Weiss built Earhart Perkins. Him and Bill Belichick developed the system. Well, that's the kind of guy who looks at an offense and says, here's what we have, let's try to do this, because it would make more sense with the guys we have, and look at the success they've had since 2000, and they implemented this. That's ultimately what we need, is for somebody to come in and to understand in 2019 what teams look like. In in 2019, you got to understand the rules, you got to understand defenses, you got to understand all this stuff, and then you have to understand the Packers, and you have to understand their players, and you have to understand your quarterback and his strengths and his weaknesses. And then you have to try to... Be, I mean, it's, it's complex stuff. You know, can you call the right play at the right time? Do you know when to use timeouts and when not to? I mean, this is all head coaching stuff, but as far as implementing and designing and 
whatever a offensive system? This is a much more complicated question. Obviously, sitting here, I, have, I don't have a clue. I don't have a clue. It seems to me that he can't, but I don't know that. I don't know. I mean, just, just because they ran an Earhart Perkins system doesn't mean that it was the exact same system they did in New England. Maybe he did adapt it. Maybe he did. I don't know. So, anyways, that, that's sort of my short-form problem with... Uh, McDaniels. I, I, I'm less upset about what happened in Indianapolis than a lot of other people are. Obviously, that's not a good thing. It's not something you want to have happen. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to downplay it too much, but technically, it wasn't really even official. They had never he had never signed on the dotted line. I think the Colts kind of jumped the gun and made an announcement prematurely before you know before there was ink to paper saying, hey, he's going to be our guy. And then, again, prior to him actually formally accepting and signing on the dotted, dotted line, the Patriots reached out and said, here, we'll give you a lot more. And he came back. Now, I'm sure there was probably some verbal agreement. And it's still, it's not a good thing what he did. But, I, you know, whatever. I don't care. I, I'm less concerned about that. The biggest issues I have is, again, it, it, does he have any pension as an offensive guy or does he just know how to run the Patriots can he just call plays for Brady does he know how to do that really well but really this offense kind of runs itself I mean after he left again the Patriots were fine even with Bill Belichick at the helm and they had um, you know Bill O'Brien was the quarterback's coach so he was probably taking over a good amount of responsibility but even without him and without an offensive coordinator for two years the team went on and did fine and then they elevated O'Brien and he he came in and the team was still fine again you know it's it's I think (laughs) I think even without an offense you probably don't even need an offensive coordinator in New England because Tom Brady knows the system Tom Brady can call the plays let Bill Belichick and Tom Brady come up with a general game plan Tom Brady can call the plays and I bet they wouldn't even lose they'd they'd be in the playoffs next year no problem then of course you look at Bill O'Brien what happened he comes in as the offensive coordinator. The team does great as always. He gets hired by the Texans, and what happens to the Texans? They're not good. It's a bad reputation for coordinators leaving New England and going places and not being very good. Maybe part of that is because what the Patriots do is a system. right? It was a brilliant thing devised for not just the Patriots, but for you know Tom Brady, the guy that's still there. And you get a bunch of people that come into New England and you are a New England guy now. You are a Patriots guy and you run a system how the Patriots run a system. And you call plays like we call plays. And you try to implement that somewhere else and it's just like, what is this nonsense? Get this out of here. I don't understand what you're talking about. This is trash. Give me, oh, and and by the way, Bill O'Brien, I don't think, ran this Earhart Perkins system. They, They ran a spread offense at that time. So I, whatever. Point is, I'm definitely hesitant. Um, I don't know for any reason. I don't have any reason to believe that this offense is great because of McDaniels. The only thing that I really like is that they felt the need to offer him a lot of money to bring him back. We do see growth and adaptation within the Patriots offense. It would be nice to see the Packers try to run something more like the Patriots, um, which I would hope that he could come over and do that. I think if, if, again, if we can run the Patriots offense, I think it would look great. I think Aaron Rodgers, if he's willing to adapt to it I think it would be I mean it's really it's what we've been begging for all season just hit the check down he's open right it's not even so much scheme and design it was just Aaron Rodgers refusing to 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 just hit the check down always wanting to go deep always wanting the big play breaking the pocket trying to direct traffic come on man go this way go that way I want to hit 20 yards every time and then he'd go and do a press conference when we're all saying wow why does he have to go deep all the time he goes up in front of the media and he's like you know what the problem is we're not throwing deep enough it's like what in the world are you talking about but there's there's that question and then there's finally the question of Josh McDaniels and Aaron Rodgers getting along and that would be one of my biggest concerns because they're very very strong personalities and if you know again The locker room takes care of itself as long as you're winning. I could easily see in year one, the Packers aren't getting better. McDaniels is trying to push Rodgers really hard to do this because you will do what I say. I'm the head coach. This is the new system. This is what you're going to do. Rodgers is going to try to do it the old way. He's going to want to go break the pocket. He's going to want to hit deep shots. McDaniels is going to get right in his face and say, you need to smarten up and do what I tell you, and it's just going to devolve instantly. And maybe that could happen anywhere at any time, but... 
you know, a couple of young, strong-headed people. Rodgers is, you know, this is my team. I'm the guy. I know what to do. These are my guys. You know, you're, you're just renting space here. So, yeah, I have my concerns with Josh McDaniels. I could see it going well. I could see it going poorly. But, um, again, I don't know. I really don't know. Another name that's popped up is Mr. Matt LaFleur, which uh, if you've been listening for a while, you know I'm not a big fan of. Now, I wanted to look a little bit more in depth because what I've been saying is this is a team. It's pretty straightforward as far as the numbers go. It doesn't make sense. Now, that numbers aren't everything, but just based on what it is, you've got the offensive coordinator of the Rams, the Rams are really, really good on offense. He leaves and goes somewhere else. And uh, the Titans actually get worse and are one of the worst offenses in the NFL. And the Rams are still one of the more dominant offenses in the NFL. So, I, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. And when I saw that they were looking to interview him, I didn't think too much of it. A lot of these interviews, I understand, are um, fact-finding things. And I definitely understand, because the Rams are sort of the gold standard, it would make sense to pick Matt LaFleur's brain a little bit. But I, I, I kind of wanted to not just assume all these are fake and only guys I like, which I don't even really have any, are serious contenders. So I wanted to just watch the Titans a little bit. I don't know that I have a problem with the scheme. Now, I know the offensive coordinator has more than just scheme to figure out. You know, Maybe he's a bad play caller. I, I don't know. And maybe it's just the game that I picked was a more impressive game. But I did see creativity. I saw just about on every single play, somebody's open. And when things broke down, it was usually a bad throw by Mariota and or Mariota being under pressure. Otherwise, it was kind of just like clockwork. So I don't know. I, I'm not going to invest too much more time into it until we get some more closure on that. I don't know if that's a legitimate candidate or not. Because, again, things change when you go to a different team. But to go to a team and to have it regress to the point where they are about as bad of a team as you could possibly get on offense, that says a lot. Again, they're they're at this particular point in time, 27th in points, 25th in yards. The only reason they're deep, they're often, or <laughs> the only reason their team is really doing anything right now is because their defense is 3rd in points and 8th in yards. Their defense is just dominant. The offense is just complete garbage and it's not that it was necessarily good last year but it was better they were 19th in points 23rd in yards hilariously the offensive coordinator was terry robisky don't know really who that is but they ran an Earhart perkins system <laughs> so and i you know it could just be one of those things too you, you when you switch systems it gets to be kind of a problem so you go from Earhart perkins which really relies on simplicity and then you get the Rams offense coming over. You could understand that being a little, uh, you know, a little rocky. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll kind of loosen the reins on my uh, opinion of that. Because they've been running that Earhart Perkins system um, for a very long time. It's it's more all Mariota, Mariota has known for the past three years that he's been the head or the uh, the quarterback. That's been their system. So, you know, maybe. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe this is just an extremely complex... And it is. I think I think it's weird because I, I kind of think of them in similar terms. But I, just, just watching it, I feel like the Patriots system, even though it's similar in the idea that we're going to scheme a guy open and you have to throw it to that guy, when I watch the Patriots, it seems more simplistic. I'm talking about, you know, throwing behind the line of scrimmage, you know, the, the, the running back running a curl route, you know, simplistic stuff where you know who the guy is going to be open. You know, there's going to be a, a guy close to the line of scrimmage that's open. And, you know, there's other guys running routes. If somebody's open, fine. But when I watch the Rams offense, it's it's a lot of I mean, they've got four guys, five guys. they got, you know, a bunch of formations. they got motion. And when somebody's open, it's, you know, maybe there's a, um, of course, there's a primary receiver. But it just seems like you need to be a little more cerebral to be able to go through your progressions quickly because the primary isn't going to be the check down, right? There's going to be a scheme. Somebody's going to get open, but you got to find them. And then if you don't, you got to quickly get to your check down or what. You know what I mean? It's actually probably pretty similar to what the Packers were doing. But I just I do think it's a much more complex thing, even though in philosophy it kind of works the same when it's working. Like if you watch the Rams and the Patriots, the things that they do well are pretty similar. It's just how you get to that point that, that changes things. 
you know, efficient, effective offense that just keeps moving the ball quickly down the field in a very frustrating manner in which you just can't stop it. But again, two very different philosophies and approaches as to how we get there. So, yeah, you know, maybe I will kind of reserve judgment a little bit. I might watch another couple games. I'll I'll maybe watch one in which they were horrible. Maybe this past week, (laughs) 17 to 33. I don't know, just just see if I can kind of make better sense of it. But um, yeah, it, it definitely makes sense. I'm not upset that they're interviewing him for no other reason than, again, the information that he has in his mind is worth picking at a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm actually kind of curious how much information, like when are you kind of crossing the line as far as asking questions and when are guys who are looking for a job, especially a head coaching job, who are willing to bend over backwards to get it, at what point are they going to say, I, I don't think I want to give you that. I don't really know where the line is. I think that'd be kind of interesting. Like, yeah, we'd like to bring you in for an interview if you wouldn't mind bringing your uh, a, a photocopied playbook. <laughs> just bring the whole thing and, um, you know, maybe just leave it when you leave. Just so we can peruse, you know, what it is you've done over there. Just consider that your resume. Turn in your playbook. <laughs> uh, another name that came up was Brian Flores, the defensive play caller for the New England Patriots. He's not officially the defensive coordinator, although he was sort of the de facto defensive coordinator. I have to assume this is an extremely long, long shot. I, I know there's some talk about he's kind of young, up-and-coming kind of thing, but, I mean, it's he was under Matt Patricia, and look how unfortunate Matt Patricia has been. I, I just I really don't see any benefit to it. I mean, unless this guy is just an absolute freakish genius. And to be fair, looking at the uh, the Patriots, according to Pro Football Focus, it's pretty solid. Certainly better than last year, but if you go back two years to 2016, that's where you get somewhat of a discrepancy. According to just stats, in 2016, the Patriots' defense was number one in points, number eight in yards. This season, they're seventh in points, 21st in yards. If you look at pro football focus, even though they were number one in the NFL in 2016 and they're number, uh, well, tied for third in 2018, if you look at just the score, because again, that's relative, and even even the stats are relative, because you're first compared to 31 other teams. What, what would they be this year? I don't know. Probably not eighth, I guess. But but as far as their their um, their grade here, almost identical to 2016. They're only third because there's two teams in front of them and one that's tied to them. That's the Texans and the Bears. So. You know, again, it's it's maybe worth bringing them in. We also do have a pretty big decision to make as far as um, defensive coordinator. You know, are we keeping Mike Pettin? Are we moving on, bringing him in to interview him, whether it's for head coaching or defensive coordinator or whatever it might be? I mean, just bringing him in for an interview, it's not the worst thing in the world. Maybe get a sense for him. And it, it could also help, too, with Josh McDaniels because there's, there's a good chance if Josh McDaniels comes in, we want to allow him to pick his staff, including defensive coordinator, and it wouldn't be all that shocking if he chooses um, Mr. Brian Flores. So before we hand over the keys and allow him to bring in Brian Flores, I want to make sure that we like Brian Flores and we want him here and he has the right attitude. So again, a lot of reasons why you could be bringing guys in. Um, Fact-finding, just kind of getting your bearings. Uh, we did play the Patriots, so it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. You know, obviously we got to see what they did against us offensively and defensively to just, you know, just bring them in talk about that game. Like, tell me about it. What what did you see when you played us? What were you scheming for? What, what were you looking for, right? Because a lot of this is, when I say fact-finding, it's finding out what it is we're doing wrong here. You know, Mike Pettin had a game plan. So you're talking to their, their offensive coordinator, Josh McDaniels, and you're asking him about it. What what did you what was what was the plan coming into this? What was your thought about this team defensively? Were were you worried? Which players were you worried? You know, including my draft picks. I know it's more of a Murphy thing, but I would assume Gutekunst is going to be in there. You know, what what were your thoughts on on Jair? What do, what do you think about the young guys? What do you think about this team in general? Which is a tough question, because if you're trying to get them to say, you guys are kind of trash and we weren't really scared of you, probably not the right answer in a job interview. But similarly with Brian Flores, right? This, I mean, this is the Green Bay Packers. This is Aaron Rodgers. What, what was the plan coming in? What were you scared of? What were you not scared of? What was the emphasis? Why? It makes sense. Flores, by the way, he's a extremely young guy. He's 37 years old. And he is 
all Patriots all day long. Started off in 2004 as a scouting assistant, became a pro scout in 2006, moved on to special teams as a coach, uh, as an assistant 2008, moved on to assistant offense and special teams 2010, defensive assistant 2011, safeties coach in 2012, linebackers coach in 2016, and now, you know, sort of defensive coordinator in 2018. So the, the, the really crazy thing about it, and maybe why you would consider him for a head coaching job, is because he, he didn't really come up the way a lot of other guys did. I mean, you look at a lot of these other coaches, I mean, man, could you imagine at 37 if he became a head coach? But he's flying up through the ranks. I mean, the guy's just a few years older than I am. But he started off as a scout, then he went to special teams, then assistant offense. So he spent he, he started off on special teams and then offense before becoming a defensive assistant and then defensive coordinator. So I mean he he's barely even getting his feet wet with this stuff. He was he was only a scout from two thousand four to two thousand seven before he became a special teams assistant. He only did that for two years. Then he goes on to offense and special teams for one year. All of a sudden he's a defensive assistant. Like why? Why what is happening? He only did that for a year. Then they make him their safeties coach. He does that for three years. Well, I guess four years. Then for three years, he's he's a linebacker's coach. And then they make him DC, or defensive play caller. Um, you know, looking into him a little bit deeper, he's he's got a, uh, you know, he grew up in the Bronx. Unbelievably difficult situation. Violence, poverty, etc. So, I mean, just, just incredibly unique. And it does make sense, I guess, just looking at this to at least bring him in. Because if you're looking for the next McVay... You're kind of looking at this kind of a stuff. This this kind of a stuff. It's just this is just different. This is very different. You know this this isn't 14 years as a you know college you know working your way up and then becoming a college head coach and then you're a college head coach for 10 years and now you're you know 49 50 years old and you're looking to make or then you become an you know, offensive coordinator in in the NFL and you do that for three different teams and then now you're looking to become a head coach. You know, at at fifty nine years old, I mean, this is a guy that just I don't know. I can't even explain it. And the fact that there's not even really a specialty, right? It's not like he, he was a defensive assistant and then you know defensive whatever, and then he goes into linebacking assistant, then linebackers coach, and then you know run game coordinator. You know, it's just it's not even like a linear thing. Scout, special teams, offense defense, safeties, linebackers, defensive coordinator. Like, and he spends like a year doing each one. And it makes sense they're not going to give him that title because it's kind of crazy, but, I mean, they let him try it out. Like, no, we're not going to promote you quite yet because, I mean, you're like 15 years old. You got here like two days ago as a scout, assistant scout, assistant to the <laughs> to the scout. But, um, I mean... It, it makes sense for that reason because you're you're looking for those gems and it's possible this is the guy. So you bring him in, you pick his brain, you, you throw everything you got at him. Because at the very least, I need to know why he's he's rising so quickly. I have to understand this because it's very rare, it's very unusual, and the defense of the, the defense of the Patriots is competent. They lost Matt Patricia. And by the way, last year this defense was garbage. Under Matt Patricia, defense has been very good for a very long time. They completely fell off in 2017. 2018, they bounce back under a team that just doesn't have a defense. And granted, Bill Belichick is the defensive guru over there. He's a defensive-minded guy. But again, I at least need to understand what's going on. I need to talk to this guy. And if nothing else, bringing him over as a defensive coordinator could be very intriguing. Uh, Another guy that they requested an interview with is Steelers offensive line coach Mike Munchak. You probably remember his name. He was the head coach of the Tennessee Titans from 2011 to 2013. Born and raised in Scranton, Pennsylvania, so that alone is pretty awesome, for obvious reasons. And if you don't know that reason, I'm would just I I don't know. Welcome to the podcast. But he was a longtime offensive lineman, been doing it forever. Um, became a coach with the Oilers for a while. Offensive line coach for the Tennessee Titans slash Oilers from '97 to 2010. That's when he jumps up to head coach, which is a pretty big jump. Lost his job after 2013, went back to being an offensive line coach, this time for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He took over for the uh, the brilliant Jeff Fisher, obviously one of the greatest coaches of all time. He immediately took a 6-10 and team, made them a 9-7 and team. 
To be fair, though, that's when they acquired Matt Hasselbeck. So, you know, these things happen. Jake Locker ends up taking over the next year. They go 6-10, and 10, which is no bueno. The next year they go 7-9, and nine, which is just boring, and then he got fired. By the way, in his third year, Ryan Fitzpatrick. So three years, three different quarterbacks, basically 8-8 eight and eight overall kind of team. He goes back to being an offensive line guy. Why is he being interviewed? I don't know. It is worth noting, by the way, after he left, Ken Wisenhunt comes in, they go 2-14. and 14. So he did improve the team. Basically, there was a little spike, right? Jeff Fisher's there. They're like a six-win team. He comes in. They become like an eight-nine-win team. He leaves. Suddenly, they're a two-win team. Charlie Whitehurst was <laughs> was the quarterback for... Well, Whitehurst, Mettenberger, and Locker all played seven games each. Jordan Palmer played one. So, I mean, the quarterback situation, it was an absolute nightmare. But um, then three and 13. So, you, I mean, you look at this team... Basically, until Mariota comes in in his first year, he brings this team to nine and seven. But I mean, this is a this is a terrible team. Mike Malarkey comes in, makes them nine and seven, just like you know Munchak did. But it just seems a little bit strange, I guess. You know, Munchak is he's an offensive line guy, so to take that leap from offensive line coach to head coach is just strange. And maybe maybe it's just more to do with you know. You want him more as a head coach than an offensive coordinator, as much as that seems weird. Maybe that's kind of the move. You bring him in because of his leadership and and whatever else he brings to the team. And then you bring in an offensive coordinator like a Lafleur or whatever to run the offense. I don't really know. It seems very strange. Again, this is another weird kind of thing you don't usually see. you got to kind of work your way up. Usually after this from offensive line, he would have become an offensive coordinator to give him an opportunity to run an offense, right? Implement an offensive system, call plays, see what you can do. I mean, to go from an offensive line coach to teaching 300 pound guys how to get in the way, I don't mean that to sound overly simplified or anything, but to go from that to head coach just doesn't make any sense. But relatively successful, again, why are they interviewing them? I don't know. Maybe they're intrigued by that. And they're like, you know, all things considered, that wasn't bad. Beyond that, offensive line, I mean, we're mixing it up a little bit. We've got uh, offensive guys. We've got defensive guys. We're going for an offensive line guy. The next guy we're going to talk about is a tight end guy. Again, we're, we're, we're reaching out. And this is a guy who's a longtime offensive lineman, knows offensive line very, very well. We need help at offensive line. Pittsburgh Steelers have a very good offensive line and have had for a long time. He's been the offensive line coach for the Steelers from 2014 to present. I don't know if you've got a better offensive line I mean, the Packers have had great offensive lines. There's a lot of good ones, but the Steelers have been phenomenal. Especially if you talk about run blocking, those guys are good. But again, it's just, it's worth bringing them in. It's a different dynamic. Let's talk offensive line. And again, how much can you you push this guy? I mean, if, if you're the GM, wouldn't you want a guy like Mike Munchak to come in and talk to you about your offensive line? Tell me what you see. Tell me what we're doing wrong. And, 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 you know, Mike's got a, it's kind of one of those unfortunate situations where you got to answer the questions because you can't just say, no, they're not being serious. They're not going to give me this job. They're just trying to squeeze information out of me. But at the same time, you don't want to just be used as a pawn to try to help a team build their team up. But from the Packers standpoint, who cares, right? We're, we're going to bring in one of the most, you know, leading offensive line people and we're going to talk about the Packers' offensive line, and he's going to tell us his thoughts on it. And you can go beyond that. He, he's got head coaching experience. Let's talk about that. You know, And again, with every interview, you're talking about the Packers. Tell me what you see when you look at the Packers. What do you like? What do you dislike? What, what would you do different? What do you, it's all just information, and it's all good information. And again, we're getting it from another vantage point, and this is from an offensive line coach. So we'll talk generally. We'll even touch on defense because this is a head coaching job. You've got to talk defense. But we especially want to talk offensive line. That's your specialty. What do you think? What's going on here? Where are we going wrong? Maybe find out some new stuff. And again, you don't get much better than the Steelers, especially if you're trying to run the ball. The success they've had. You know, every time Le'Veon Bell goes down, it's like, well, there goes their run game, and then somebody else comes in and just dominates. That's an offensive line, ladies and gentlemen. That's the reason it's so successful. Finally, as I alluded to, a tight end coach, Mr. Dan Campbell, Currently the assistant head coach slash tight end coach for the New Orleans Saints. Uh, Do I think he's a legitimate head coaching candidate? Probably not so much. He did kind of follow the correct path. You know, he was a player, 
was a coaching intern, tight ends coach. He was also an interim head coach. So obviously, regardless of what you think about him in the position, you you know you're thinking, you know, tight ends coach is pretty far down the rung. But when the Miami Dolphins threw a couple people out, he's the one that they said we want you to be our head coach. So obviously, leaning on him and his experience and his intelligence. Um, and now with the Saints, he is an assistant head coach slash tight ends coach. So he's he's getting that exposure. That's usually a good kind of internship. Basically, you're the tight ends coach, but we're going to give you added responsibilities, and uh, that's the kind of stuff that you put on a resume to help you to become a head coach. He's also only 42, so he's pretty young. Again, former player, offensive-minded guy. I would assume this is another guy that you bring in who's going to bring in an offensive coordinator that's going to run the offense. Not that he can't necessarily do it, but he doesn't have that offensive coordinator experience. He's a tight ends coach, and he went kind of from tight end to head coach. So, I mean, it's more of, again, that's more of like a leadership managerial kind of thing, which is what a head coach is. Not to say you can't also be that, but especially for a first-time head coach and a guy that's never been an offensive coordinator, you don't want him to be head coach and offensive coordinator. That's way too much responsibility, considering he's never done either of those two things. So if you like him as a leader and, um, you know, the direction he wants to go, whatever, fine, you bring him on, but you need to have an offensive coordinator that's going to run your offense. But again, as far as fact-finding goes, you probably recall we did play the Dolphins. So this is an opportunity to talk to a guy that, you know, at the very least, <laughs> it's somebody that could potentially be a candidate. You know, I mean, you don't want to just waste these everybody's time, their time, your time, whatever. He's somebody that would be interested in, in a head coaching job, so it's got to be somebody that's going to accept it. You know, you don't want to get the water boy and be like, hey, man. Uh, you want to be a head coach? Maybe you should come over here and then just pump them for information. Like, what what play did they call? I know you were standing by them. Tell me what play that was. We've got you on camera, dog. Don't lie to me. You want this job or not, punk? <laughs> but also because he's not just the tight ends coach, but the assistant head coach, so he has more knowledge of what exactly, not just the not just as a general coach, but also he understands, you know, game plan and things like that. So again, you can pump him for that information. When you came to Green Bay, tell me about what the game plan was. Tell me, you know, give me your scouting report on the Packers. What did you guys discuss? What did you talk about? I mean, he's he's the one doing a lot of the grunt work. He's the assistant head coach. You want to be an assistant? Fine. You're, you're doing a lot of paperwork. You're doing a lot of research. You know, it sounds like a glorious job, but it's not. It's just you're the coach's secretary. But he also has a lot of information, and he would know all that information. And then again, tight ends. He knows tight ends. He played as a tight end. He understands all this stuff. Packers have had a lot of terrible... (laughs) It's been bad with tight ends. So you can talk specifically about that. You're the tight ends guy. Talk to me about the tight ends. You know, when when we played you guys, what what exactly were were you looking at with Jimmy Graham and whatnot? So... Pretty interesting, and it, the the other good thing about this is, you know, coming into this, everybody had a list of about five, six names, and then you kind of scratch them off and say, I don't like them for this or that reason, and you're like, see, there's nobody else, and then you hear these names, and you look at it, and it's like, well, that's definitely somebody. There's a lot of people out there, and there could be some, not could, there are gems. Whether we're going to find them or not, I don't know. You know, maybe there's some random special teams assistant that's just an absolute guru that's flying up the ranks that's not on anybody's radar yet. They're out there. Packers are watching very closely. Everybody's watching. It's a matter of, are we going to identify them? Are we going to get them in? Are we going to be able to hire them? But anyways, that's sort of the latest on uh, what's going on there. As far as guys that I think are actual candidates to come over here, um, McDaniels obviously is a legitimate candidate. I would say Lafleur maybe is, but it's, it's a tough sell for me just because the production was so low. In other words, you need to prove that you can be an offensive coordinator before I want you as a head coach, and I don't know that he did that. And obviously, if you hire him as a head coach, he's going to also be the offensive play caller. doesn't really make sense to bring him in and then get a different guy because the scheme is is kind of his whole deal. What sense does it make to have him come in with the Rams playbook but then give it to somebody else who's going to have some, you know, whatever, a completely different system? So essentially, Lafleur, what he's... What we want him for is his ability and his scheme, but we're just going to use him in a managerial aspect (laughs) to be a motivator and a game manager, and he's going to come up with the plan. Yeah, no, sorry. Otherwise, I think we're we're pumping a lot of guys for information, and maybe with uh, Flores, we're looking possibly at a rising star. That could also be the case with uh, 
with Dan Campbell. Again, you know, to have the tight ends coach kind of step up to be an interim head coach, there might be something there. But we don't know until we bring him in and talk to him. And if nothing else, we've, we've got a fact-finding thing going on. We're learning about our organization, and maybe we'll come across somebody that just blows our socks off. I don't know. Personally, I don't think I'm a big fan of any of these guys. But that's just, I mean, I, listen, I'm looking for just something you look at and go, yeah, that's the guy. I don't think that exists. I just don't. I, I mean, we, we know all the big names. We know that there are people who are successful. There's people who aren't successful, and we, we've kind of identified all of them. So whoever it is that gets hired, there's going to be negatives. That's all there is to it. There's going to be stuff to identify that's not going to look good, but at the end of the day, the Packers are going to pick somebody, and either they're going to be a success or they're not, and we're not going to find out for a very long time. But um, anyways, that's about it. That's the latest that I could find on the head coaching information. Um, you know, might have a decision relatively soon. I'm assuming they're going to run through these uh, interviews, but at the same time, if they've got somebody that they like, as much as we'd like to keep talking to people... You know, if, if uh, for example, if McDaniel's is the guy, if we interview him and it's like, yes, this is the guy, you you, you got to wrap it up. You got to offer him a contract right then and there, because there's a lot of teams looking for head coaches, and I'd be shocked if he doesn't get a head coaching job, just because of how many teams need head coaches. I mean, he's got to be top of the list. Maybe some teams take him off the list, but of the teams that have him on, he he's going to be at the top, and they're going to take him. So, anyways, that's it. You folks enjoy your day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye bye.